started. Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, today we're going to be talking about acing the interview uh, and we'll, we'll dive a little bit deeper into virtual interviewing. But before we get started, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is CJ Neely. I'm the Assistant Director of Career Education at the Professional Development Office, um, Professional Development and Career Office, the PDCO at Johns Hopkins University. So just some for instructions for today, we're going to just ask that everyone stays muted and that their videos are off just to reduce background noise. If you have any questions, feel free to use the chat box. I'll be monitoring that. We'll also have additional time for Q&A towards the end. The session will be recorded. Uh, that way the recording um, can be posted for those who are unable to attend um, and it will be made available through the Leadership Alliance um, website. If you'd like to take a screenshot and share publicly, that's fine. Just please notify me. Um, and it, again, uh, please use the chat box for, for asking questions. So we're going to cover quite a bit today. Uh, we'll go over some basics of interviewing. Then we're going to do a deeper dive into the various types of interviewing. Again, I'll provide plenty of insight into virtual interviewing tips to be successful. We'll talk about how to handle interview questions. We'll go over common interview questions as well as behavioral interviewing and um, some tips to navigate that space. And then at the very end, I'll touch on how to give an industry job talk and how that differs from academia. Um, if And obviously we won't be able to go through all the industries. So again, if you have specific questions about um, maybe interviewing in your field, we can always talk about that during the Q&A at the end. So what are employers looking for when they're interviewing a candidate? Oftentimes they'll say they're looking for a really strong skill set, and this will include communication, leadership, technical skills, teamwork, inter uh, interpersonal skills, uh, someone who's a really good problem solver. And then there are certain personality traits that employers will say over and over again that they're looking for in a candidate. So things like integrity, adaptability, strong worth ethic, someone who's motivated as well as innovative. Um, and this really is across all different fields and settings. But what an employer is really um, looking for, what they really want to know is, do you have the technical skills to do a job? And, you know, does your personality fit within a given organization? Are you interested in doing the work? And how long do you plan to stay at an organization? And because in many settings, especially outside of academia, you're often working in a collaborative team environment, how well do you fit in the, uh, with, how well does your personality fit with the existing team members? And so, Really, if you've been invited to interview, your cover letter and resume have already demonstrated that you have the basic technical skills to do the job. So the vast majority of interviewing is really trying to assess if you are the right fit. And so that's something to kind of keep in mind as you move forward in your interview process. And so if you're unfamiliar with um, the hiring process, I thought it would be helpful just to give you some oh, like. Uh, insight into what that looks like. So for most jobs that you'll apply for, you'll submit your application online, you'll be one of 100 plus applicants, um, and usually that initial vetting is done by a human resource professional. Um, the human resource professional will, you know, basically assess from your resume and your cover letter, can you do the job? And we won't have an opportunity to talk about how to write a successful uh, resume, but really, one thing to note when you are applying is that this first round with the human resource um, individual, they're usually not a professional within the field, meaning if you're applying for a research role in industry, they're typically not a research scientist. And so they're going off job, the job description as well as maybe a conversation with the hiring manager, having a general idea of the type of candidates that are hired within the field. Um, but they, they don't know the technical information in and out. And so you have to make sure that your resume can be assessed by a non-scientist and that it matches the, the job description and that you're not being lost um, through this process. 
So the HR professional is going to take these hundreds of applicants that come in or applications and really just try to narrow that down and give a much smaller number to the hiring manager to go through. So typically, let's just say 30 applicants are sent on to a hiring manager. A hiring manager will then um, kind of vet these Oftentimes, we'll tell the human resource person who is their top candidates of the 30 that either the human resource person or the hiring manager would then reach out for a phone interview. And it may actually that you have multiple phone interviews, um, one, uh, first time with the human resource person and then with the hiring manager. And this is really a screening process to try to narrow down that initial um, that second applicant pool into a much more manageable number. Um, and so from there, they'll pick after the phone interview who they think are the, you know, three to five best amp applicants to get to the to kind of those final round interviews. Um, typically, the final interview is an in person interview, but uh, during this time where we have stay at home orders, almost all interviewing is done virtually. Um, and even prior to COVID, I think close to 50% of employers were saying they, they were using virtual interviewing in some capacity uh, throughout their process. So I suspect as we move forward um, that virtual interviewing will become a very common part of all interviewing um, in the future. Although I do believe that eventually um, when the pandemic is over that those final round interviews will be in person. And one thing to note is that when you're being screened throughout this process, when you're being interviewed, uh, initially the questions are really going to focus on can you do the job, but as you get closer to the final round interviews, this is where they're going to really assess if you're the right fit. Um, and we'll talk about this and the types of questions um, in the end, but the goal is to really identify one person to hire for a job. And I think it's really helpful just to have a good understanding of what this process looks like as you navigate your own um, interview process. So here are just some few tips that I think everyone should take when preparing for any interview, regardless if it's a phone, virtual, or in person. So doing your research ahead of time is absolutely essential. You want to research the organization, the team or department that you're going to be working with, get as much information you can about the role. If you're able to get an agenda and, uh, ahead of time, which especially as you move further in the process, I would highly encourage you to try to get an agenda so you know who you're meeting with um, to research those people as well. Uh, ways that you can get information is by looking things up on the company's website. This is a great place to find the mission statement, any strategic visions that they may have published. I think LinkedIn is great a great way to look into the people that you'll be interviewing with. Do you have some sort of connection? What is it that they study? This might give you an indicator of the questions they might ask. Um, for example, if you're uh, in your interview you might be meeting with someone who isn't in your division. Maybe there's one aspect of the job description that kind of relates to that division. And so maybe a business person is gonna ask you about your budget experience, which is only a very small part of the job, but that's what they care about because that's how they're gonna uh, interact with you if you were to get this position. I also think it's good to look um, at LinkedIn and Twitter for the company to see if there's any news releases, anything new that came out from the company. These are tidbits that you can mention um, throughout your interview that will make you stand out and indicate that you've done your research. I would also encourage you to review your materials ahead of time. If you are graduating or finishing up your postdoc and entering the job market, it's very likely that you're applying for many positions at the same time. Um, and it may take a few weeks from the time that you apply to the time that you're contacted uh, for an interview. And so it's good to remember how you presented yourself to the employer um, and that you're having a consistent message um, from the time you're making that first impression with applying to, the, to every round in the interview moving, moving forward. Um, I think an essential part of successfully interviewing is also anticipating questions and practicing ahead of time. We'll spend a lot of time actually talking about this in the later in the talk. 
Um, and then another thing is at every stage in the interview, they're most likely going to finish the conversation asking, do you have any questions for us? And it look, it's very helpful to have prepared questions um, and to have thoughtful questions. And I'll give some examples uh, on questions that you can use at each stage. So as I said, there are multiple types of interview. There's phone interviews, virtual interviews, and in-person. Um, I think right now in-person interviews have been suspended across the board, so there is a big uptick of virtual interviewing. So you definitely want to learn more about that. So for interviews, again, are usually that first round screen interview. They're often very short. Um, Typically, they are done by an HR professional. Sometimes if you're working with a recruiter, your first um, interaction will be with a recruiter. Um, in rare occasions, that phone interview will be with a hiring manager, but it's usually with someone else first. And most uh, commonly, you'll be reached out by someone will contact you via email and ask for a time to, set, to schedule this. Um, and you're basically aiming for something that's mutually beneficial for you and the other person. I think as an interviewee, you should be very flexible and try to make something work. Um, oftentimes, these interviews can be quite short, 15 minutes, but I always allocate at least 30 minutes in case the conversation goes well. I don't want to have to rush off and, and, and uh, end the conversation early. That's not a great way to... Um, leave a lasting positive impression. I make sure that wherever I'm doing my interview, it's in a very quiet place. There has been times for me in the past, and I know for many of the alumni and trainees that I've worked with, where they've gotten a phone call unexpectedly and, and, they, and they've proceeded with the interview and you know felt a little flustered because they were in lab or just not in a situation to, to be interviewed. And if, if you are contacted by a recruiter or a hiring manager and they want to do the phone interview at that moment and if you're not ready for it just be very enthusiastic and polite and say you know i'm very excited to hear from you i'm, I'm incredibly interested in the position unfortunately this is not a great time i, I, I um, would love to reschedule is there any way we could do that and so that way when you are able to reschedule you're completely focused and ready to have an engaging conversation as I said, you always should do research before having an interview. I think for phone interviews, the two things that people um, really should focus on, um, in addition to doing research about the company, is common interview questions. So early on, you'll get a lot of these, and we'll talk about what some common interview questions are. Um, and then I would not be surprised if for many organizations, especially working with a recruiter, you may be asked about salary expectations. And you really, for me personally, I try not to discuss salary until I have a job offer um, because I have no power to negotiate until there's an offer on the table. However, if I am asked about a salary and I Basically, they really want me to respond. I want to make sure I've done my research ahead of time so I can give a thoughtful answer early in the process. So I'll say something, I'll one, look on um, websites such as Glassdoor, salary.com, Payscale, things like that, to get a better idea of what roles in that organization or other organizations in that particular geographic region are paying. Um, I'll do my best to get identify what I think is a fair range for that role and responsibility, again, in that geographic location, and also based off of how much experience I'm coming to the table. And so I'll say, you know, something along the lines where it's very difficult to, to say what a uh, fair uh, pay would be for, for this particular role without knowing more about the responsibility, but if I had to guess based off the job description, um, I think a fair range would be this and this for someone with my level of experience. So that's one way you can handle it professionally. And again, a lot of what this early questions about salary expectation are is just to know if there's alignment between what the company can do and what you're looking for. Really, they're trying to see if you're asking for something that's basically way too high for them to compensate. And so they don't want to move forward in the process if you're asking for a certain amount that's just beyond what they can pay. Uh, I also think that phone interviews can be quite challenging because they're not in person. 
Um, and, and what I mean by that is normally when you're in person, you're engaging in a conversation, you can read the other person's facial expressions, things like that. And so in a phone interview, you're going to have to work really hard to express your enthusiasm. And so one tip is to actually smile when you're talking. Uh, believe it or not, that when you smile, it actually changes the inflection of your voice and it actually, uh, here from the other person, it seems like they're happy and enthusiastic. I would also encourage you to not sit for the entire time. Oftentimes, if we're sitting for long periods of time, our body will begin to slump and this will actually affect our projection of our voice. But if you stand up and walk around, I'm not talking about walking around your neighborhood, but just, you know, casually in a quiet room, this can actually keep your energy up throughout the, you know, 15 to 30 minute phone conversation. At the end, if the interviewer asks you, do you have any questions for me, I think this is where you're going to think about who you're speaking to. If you're speaking to a recruiter or a HR professional, they're probably not going to know a lot about the dynamics of the team or the exact uh, responsibilities. So you could ask a more general questions like, what qualities are you looking for for someone in your organization? Or who would this um, position report to? That also gives you insight on who you might be able, uh, who you could look into, who would be your direct report or hiring manager moving forward in the process. If you um, also, we had just, a, we had a few people joining this late. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to join the chat box. We are recording this session. So if you miss the first few minutes, we can always, you can always view it at a later date. Um, so again, if you have questions uh, at the end of the phone interview, you'll want to ask some questions. Um, if you are with a hiring manager, um, then you can ask things more specifically, like what do you view the most um, challenging aspect of the job to be, or what qualities are you looking for a candidate? Imagine if they told you very early in the process what they're looking for in a candidate. These are things that you can sell when you're moving forward to that virtual or in-person interview. So as I said, um, virtual interviewing has existed pre-COVID, um, but it's definitely become very common in this space and has replaced in-place interviewing. Uh, so if you do have a virtual interview, um, there's just some tips that I really would like for you to keep in mind. One is to test your technology ahead of time. Make sure that you know, your computer, the, both the audio as well as the video quality are, work well. Uh, I'm sure all of you have been in Zoom or WebEx meetings, and you probably know if, if you're having glitches or issues with your computer. And if so, I would actually invest you, um, encourage you to invest in external um, cameras or microphones because you don't want the quality of your audio or, or video to impact how the interview perceives you as a candidate. But I will say that for the vast majority of people, a laptop um, and what what is uh, the camera and microphone on the laptop works just fine for most individuals. You also want to test out the technology, meaning the platform you use. So interviews, companies can range from WebEx, Zoom, Google Hangout. Um, there's even some pre-recorded uh, videos that some major employers use, uh, like HireVue. And so what are, like, again, there's a lot of technology out there, so try to figure out what platform you're using. Um, on the day of the interview, you definitely want to close down all non-essential pro programs and processes on your computer. These are your, you don't want strict distractions like your um, inbox to have uh, pop-ups coming up on your screen. Um, and you also don't want programs to potentially slow down the speed of your computer. Also limit distractions. So that could be muting your phone. It could also be closing the window to the room you're in. You don't, I literally had it. So when I was in an apartment, just a few minutes before my phone interview started, um, the landscaping company came and started mowing outside. And I frantically was running around the house trying to close all the windows. So just, again, try to prepare um, these sort of 
potential distractions ahead of time. And especially in day, uh, today's um, situation, we're often at home with roommates, maybe other family members, pets, children. Um, so do what you can to kind of limit distractions, keeping the animals out of the room, keeping children, if possible, um, maybe even out of the house, like having a significant other or another family member take the kids for a walk when you're in an interview. Another thing to do is to set the scene. So there's a couple of tips that I have for you. One is, if possible, if you have a laptop, try to prop it up a little bit so your eye is actually uh, level with the camera. You don't want it to be down and the camera looking up at you. Also, it's important to have your light source in front of you rather than behind you. When the light source is behind you, it would actually um, darken your face and it makes it very hard for the person to see, see your face. And really during a virtual interview, especially during this time, this is how they're trying to get to know you and you're trying to make that personal connection. Um, although hopefully there won't be any glitches, I do think it's advantageous to plan for a glitch. So imagine you are having problems with your connection or vice versa, the person who um, is talking to you midway through the conversation, it drops out. So maybe you want to exchange um, contact information, e um, phone numbers with the person, or at least once uh, right before the interview, maybe email them and say, you know, I'm looking forward to talking to you. If there's any issues, feel free to call me on my cell phone. Here's the number. I'm sure the person would appreciate it uh, if there was any issues that they knew how to reach out. I would also encourage you to dress the part. It's very easy with us working at home to dress quite casually um, day to day. We're working at the computer. You might want to wear a t-shirt or something like that. But I really think it's good that in any virtual interview to dress the part. I don't necessarily think you need to wear a suit and tie, um, but definitely uh, dress professionally. This is, again, your opportunity to make a good impression. They're going to imagine what it's like to work with you, um, you know, in person at some point moving forward. I also think it's essential to be very mindful of your body language, even more in a virtual setting than in person. So a lot of movement in a virtual setting can be quite distracting. So things like swaying back and forth or big hand movements can be incredibly distracting, distracting in the virtual space. So do your best to stand, uh, to keep um, your back straight, stand up, um, try to get in a position that you can stay comfortable for 20 to 30 minutes, which can be quite hard. Uh, you don't want to constantly readjust throughout the interview, virtual interview process. Um, and these are just things to kind of keep in mind that are unique to the virtual setting. Another thing is that you want to focus on the camera. It's very natural to want to look at the screen because this is where the other person is um, located on your computer. But when you do this, it doesn't look like you're making eye contact. So instead, you'll want to maintain eye contact with the camera as much as possible. Um, this, again, makes the other person feel like you're looking directly at them. I will say though, the most important aspect of interviewing is to be comfortable and, and, and if looking at the camera is something that you find you're working very hard to do and it's taking away from your interview, um, then definitely feel free to look at the screen because again, you want to come off as confident and, and engaging and someone that this person will want to work with in the future. In certain industries, it may be common to show your work in an in-person interview. So for example, if you're a data scientist, maybe you would be talking about some of the coding or programming that you've done. Um, maybe if it's in a writing field, you would have sample uh, writings that you would have submitted. And so in the virtual space, you want to use your technology as much as possible to do those same things. So if you were sharing work during a in-person interview, you would want to do the same during the virtual. So realize that most of the technology that you'll be using for, for virtual interviewing has um, share the screen capacity. So have your GitHub or whatever portfolio platform that, that you would use to um, uh, curate and share your work, have that readily available and plan to use it if it's appropriate. 
And this is where during the virtual interview, as you move further in the process, especially when it's final rounds, that you want to ask much more thoughtful questions. So what I mean by this is um, you really want to gain clarification about things that you're uncertain, questions about the position that you just still don't understand. I also think during the time of stay at home, where most of us are working from home, even though our positions will most likely return to in-person positions in the future, that it really benefits you to ask questions about gaining a better understanding of the company. So what is the company culture like? Who are your teammates like? What is the dynamics of the team? Try to gain as much insight that you can have a better idea of what your work would be like once you return to a more normal situation in the future. Because I think it's incredibly important to realize that interviewing is a two-way street. They're assessing you to figure out if you're the best candidate for the role, but you are also trying to determine if this is the right organization for you and role for you. And again, you don't want to ask um, self-serving questions, things about salary or benefits until the very end. I think it's a, I, I think it's most of that information can be found online, except for maybe salary, but really you don't have the power to negotiate until you have the offer on the table. So I think it's just best to lead with your interest in the position and your enthusiasm than, than show um, talking about money uh, this early in the, in the game. So finally, um, I wanted to share some final insights about in-person interviewing. Uh, so again, in-person interviewing is typically the last round. Now we'll be doing this in the virtual space, but um, if it is a virtual interview, these are still things to keep in mind. It, oftentimes these final round interviews are, are much more complex. In some places you might have like a one hour interview with one to two people, but more likely at your level of training, you're going to have a whole day or multiple um, components of this of interview. So with in-person, um, I would definitely ask for an agenda. So who are you meeting with? What's the length of each meeting? What are the components of it? Um, and again, like if you, if in the agenda, you find out who you're meeting with, definitely do your research ahead of time. And, and these, these full day interviews can include a lot of different components. As I said, one-on-one -on -one meetings with the hiring manager, there could be panel interviews with the various teammates. It's not uncommon to have lunch, dinner, or drinks as, um, as part of a longer interview. In certain industries, you may have to give a presentation and it's important to know the norm for the industry that you're going into. And then uh, for some, some fields, there may be case questions. For example, consulting is a field where case questions are quite common, um, a co common aspect of an interview. And so again, get that agenda, prepare for the various aspects, and also know what the norm is for the field that you're entering. So some other tips that I'd like to share um, that we haven't touched on thus far is, one is about taking notes. I think it's good to take notes throughout the very inter uh, various stages of your interview. For me, my personal tactic is to not take notes while on the interview, especially um, as much as possible on the phone and the virtual. I like to be fully present and try to keep the conversation you know, engaging, really listen to what the person's saying versus kind of like jotting things down and saying things like, uh-huh, uh-huh. Again, um, what I, my personal preference is to wait until the meeting, the interview is over and immediately jot things down when they're done. If you do take notes um, during an interview, whether that's on the phone, virtually, or in person, I, I would say take them um, in like on a notepad, uh, on paper and pen. You don't want to be in a virtual interviewing typing, um, and you definitely want, do not want to bring out a laptop in an in-person interview. So these are just my, this is my particular preference, and I just wanted to share that. I also think it's 100% absolutely essential to send a thank you email after every single interview. If you meet with the same person three times over the course of a month, 
um, as the interview process, you send a thank you after every single stage of that. If you go to an in-person interview and it's a whole day event where you're going to lunch and doing panel discussions, try to figure out everyone you've met with and their contact information. I mean, if it is a talk, it would probably be unlikely that you would know every single person in the room. But the people that you do have a more in-depth conversation, whether it's a small panel or one-on-one, email every single one of them. These emails do not need to be long. I actually feel like um, something short and concise actually works better. People are busy. But again, you're just exhibit, um, reminding them, um, you're thanking them for their time, um, further reiterating your interest in the position. Uh, if you have any questions, you might be able to drop it here. Or if you forgot to mention something that you think it would be important, this is a good time to also add that information. Uh, I have heard from some hiring managers when people do not send thank you emails that they actually pull them out of the applicant pool. Um, and I have had questions about whether to do paper versus email. Um, I think people appreciate the, the letters, but it takes so long for them to arrive. Oftentimes, they'll already start moving forward with the decision making before that letter arrives. And so if you are going to send a a mailing like thank you card, I would still encourage you to do a email as well. So at least they get that within the first 24 hours of your interview. And finally, um, I think it's essential to enter any like interview with as much confidence as possible. And the best way to be confident in an interview is to prepare, prepare, prepare. And one of the essential ways of preparing is to, again, anticipate the questions you're going to ask and answer them ahead of time or practice answering them. So that leads us to um, this kind of portion of the talk that's focusing on interview questions. And really interview questions kind of fall into two different categories. You have common interview questions as well as behavioral interview questions. Again, early in the process, typically during the phone screen, you'll have almost exclusively these common interview questions. As you move further in the process um, into virtual or in-person interviewing, this is when more behavioral interview questions will come um, out. So what are some common interview questions? Uh, there's the, tell me about yourself. I get this one for every single interview, and I also start all of my interviews asking the person to tell me about their self. Um, there are some others here, but a friend of mine told me the great way to uh, think about these common interview questions is, is that there's really a question behind the question. So for the tell me about yourself, what they're looking for is a short bio just to start the conversation. Another example is what are your strengths and weaknesses? They really want to know how self-aware are you? What is your accomplishments? What do you value? How about your friends? What would they say about you? What's your personality type? Tell me what you know about the organization. Have you done your research? And where do you see yourself in five years? How committed are you? And again, um, these are questions you'll get over and over again in an interview, and I think it's good to have a practiced answer, not something that's memorized, but something where if you do get the question that you feel confident and you're not necessarily blindsided stumbling through it. So because the tell me about yourself is such a common question, I did want to give you a framework for answering it. So my personal way of approaching the tell me about yourself is to start off with my the present situation. So what is my current role? If it's uh, relevant, I might include a recent accomplishment and highlight that. Then I talk about my past. So what have I done previously to get to where I am now? Um, I, and then finally, I talk about the future. So. I really like to transition into why I'm interested in this position. So this is what I've done, this is what I'm doing now, this is what I've done in the past, and now I'd like to join your organization um, doing X, Y, Z, or my experiences would make me a perfect candidate for this particular role. And I think it's appropriate to keep this fairly concise. So um, this is a nice framework, but really you want it, this answer to be about 15 to 30 seconds. Because again, it's just a short bio to get the conversation started. So the other category of interview questions is behavioral interview questions. Um, again, you'll get more and more of these the further you go along in the interview process. So these questions are 
basically ways for employers to evaluate your past experiences and behaviors. And the thought process is your past behaviors um, are the best predictors for future performance. So it's really easy to identify these types of questions because they all start with the same kind of phrase. So tell me about a time when you describe a situation when you did this, tell me when you approached a situation, um, think about a time. So it's all asking you about your past. So once you identified one of these questions as a behavioral interview question, you can use the STAR technique to answer it. So for those of you who have not heard of the term STAR, STAR stands for situation, task, action, result, and I actually have added a second R called reflection. This is actually um, a suggestion from one of the alumni I worked with who's now a hiring manager, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it in a moment. So when you have a behavioral interview question, you wanna start off by setting the scene, um, tell a story. So who, what, where, when. Then you wanna clearly state the task or the goal that you were working towards. Next, what were the actions you did? Because again, they're interviewing you and not the entire team. Um, and then you wanna finish up with the result. What was the outcome? What did you achieve from all of this work? And then in some cases, you, want, you may wanna add the second R reflection. What did you learn from the situation or how would, this, um, how would you do it differently next time? So I thought it would be good to give a couple of examples um, of behavioral interview questions and how you may uh, kind of use the STAR technique to break down an answer. So here's a common question. So describe a long-term project that you managed and how you kept everything moving along in a timely manner. So they're looking about, they're looking at time management skills and uh, an ability to probably um, organize uh, complex problems or projects. So I broke this down into situation. When I was a research assistant at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, I oversaw a research project that had numerous international collaborators. Um, as the project manager on this role, I had to make sure that the various deadlines were met. met. So I decided to organize regular virtual meetings to discuss our progress, the challenges, next steps, um, upcoming deadlines. And this actually led to an incredibly effective collaboration. We actually finished the project ahead of schedule, which was quite surprising, but very happy about that. And in the end, I, we ended up uh, writing up a manuscript, which we're planning to submit for publication um, next month. So again, I'm using this STAR technique to really give a concise response but also demonstrate what I can do, what I've done in the past and how this could translate into um, working for this organization. So I wanted to give another example. So tell me about a time when you failed to prioritize. So when did you fail to do something? This might be a time where you use the second R. So when I was a postdoc at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, I had an opportunity to mentor a new graduate student in the lab, but I was also, and I was also developing and teaching a course for my PI. Um, I ended up spending a ton of time focusing on my teaching and mentor responsibilities. Uh, however, I wasn't, I, I didn't, I wasn't able to actually make as much progress on my research as I liked. Once I realized that this was the case, I started blocking my time where on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I really focused on my teaching, um, developing the new coursework, grading papers, office hours, so, so on and so forth. And then Wednesday, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I was able to really focus on my research. And because I had spent a lot of time already mentoring our new graduate student, I was actually able to delegate some responsibilities and some um, basic experiments to them. And you know, with that, I was able to catch up pretty quickly. And through that process, I really learned the importance of time management. And it's a strategy that I use every time I'm working um, in the lab. So again, you're taking something that's maybe a negative situation, but you're talking about how you've learned from it and, and how you're behaving differently in the future because of it. 
So when it comes to behavioral interviewing questions that you might receive, um, here's some suggestions on how to prepare. So the first step is to basically review the job ad. So the job ad will list on there the soft skills. So things like communication, leadership, time management, organization, things that they're looking for in a candidate. And more likely than not, you'll be asked to uh, behavioral interview questions about those particular skills. Uh, you can actually do a Google search. I like Muse. Um, they have uh, a link to an article to 30 common behavioral interviewing questions, but there's a ton on there that are organized by specific skill sets. So once I have those kind of themes and questions kind of prepared, I then brainstorm past experiences. So you might want to pull out your resume and say, in what specific scenario was I able to demonstrate time management or leadership or effective communication? And then I start, I use the start technique to develop uh, potential answers to those questions. Um, the goal is, again, I think you should really practice your answers. The goal is not to memorize them. It's, be, it's more about being able to recall them when the time comes. Um, and a couple of suggestions. One, try to like variegate your responses, meaning you don't want to say, when I was a grad student, when I was a grad student, when I was a grad student. So think about other aspects of your experience, whether, whether it's participating in a student group, maybe some volunteering work. All of these things have led to you being a whole complete person. They're all relevant experiences. So make sure that you um, pull, you highlight what you've learned in a wide variety of opportunities. The one final um, piece of information I wanted to share is about the industry job talk. So if you are thinking about transitioning into industry research, you will most likely be asked to do a job talk. Um, these are typically one hour talks, but really the talks are closer to 35 to 45 minutes where the remainder of the time is Q&A. For many of the trainees I work with, they think that an industry job talk is basically giving a thesis talk or a talk that they would for conference, uh, a conference. And honestly, it is not. It's completely different. And if, if you were to go into a industry um, an interview in industry and gave your thesis talk, you will most likely leave a, a bad impression within the committee. And so in order to really think about how to give a good industry talk, I think it's important to first consider your audience. So when you go to a conference or do like go to a conference, you're usually presenting to people all within your field. But when you're doing a job talk in industry, you're having leaders, um, senior leaders come to the talk. So these may not be scientists from your field. You'll also have team members um, that you work with that are in different sectors because industry is such a um, collaborative team environment that you'll have people who are biochemists or biostatisticians um, that are all kind of working on a problem with you but using different technical skills to solve them come into uh, the scenario. You may even have people who are involved in clinical trials or regulatory affair who are not working at the bench anymore who are part of um, the audience. So really try to get to know who's going to be in the audience first and that can guide you. So some things to consider is because you have that diverse audience, it's going, you have to spend uh, a considerable amount of time kind of setting the stage, bringing everyone up to the same page. It's going to be less data than a typical academic talk because really what you're trying to do is demonstrate that you have a good understanding of the scope. Where does your research fit into the bigger picture? Um, you really want to highlight when you do share your data, what was your role and your uh, contributions, and also highlight what was a collaborative effort. Because again, in industry, um, everything is about collaborations. So they're hiring you, so what technical skills can you bring to the table, but you also want to demonstrate that you can work in, in a team environment. And instead of just showing your data and saying, this is what I found, they I think it's actually important to emphasize your problem solving skills. So when you were faced with the challenge, like collecting that data, like what was it that you did to overcome it? Because really that's what they're hiring for. Someone who is a problem solver, who comes up with, who has critical thinking skills, who, come, who can come up with uh, creative solutions. And um, 
uh, one last piece of information is that typically in an academic talk, you'll talk about next steps, but for an industry talk, this is generally not the case. So some final remarks when it comes to interviewing. The perfect interview does not exist. And so for most people, when they come back from an interview, they only think about the things that they did poorly. I, I know that I am my own worst critic. Uh, so oftentimes I'll say that went terribly, but you know, once I talk to the person afterwards, they've shared that they thought they inter like that happened to me with the current job I have now, that the interview went incredibly well. So just keep that in mind. Another thing to know is that interviewing is a learned skill. Um, for many of us, the more we do, the we, better we get. So think about that as you move forward in the process. So say you're invited to interview for a position and you're just not sure if it's the best fit for you, I would definitely encourage you to still do the work, practice, um, you know, prepare for that interview. You may end up finding out that it's really an exciting role. There's more to it than you anticipated. And in the end, if it isn't the right role, at least you've learned how to be a better interviewer in the process. Um, and that way you're better prepared for when that, your, that dream job comes available. So that's it for um, my presentation today. I did wanna see if anyone had any questions. Um, this is also my contact information. So if anyone has any questions, they can always contact me afterwards. Um, usually LinkedIn is the best way to connect with me. So again, feel free to go into the chat box and ask any questions if you have any. So while questions are coming in, I do wanna um, let everyone know that the next session um, starts at three o'clock. Uh, this is going to be alumni panel led by um, uh, Damani Pickett uh, at Hopkins University. There will be a 10 minute break followed by, um, followed by breakout rooms with the various uh, panel members. So, Again, if you, I apologize if there was any issues with the, the link joining. Um, so if you were unable to attend earlier and you did miss some of the questions uh, or information early on, this has been recorded. I'm happy it will be posted online so you'll be able to obtain that information later. Uh, so someone had asked, uh, what is the best time to send a thank you email after interview? I would say within 24 hours. So, I mean, honestly, you can send it 10 minutes after the interview happened or, you know, the next morning, but I would really try to focus within that 24 hour frame. Uh, you don't know, especially when it comes down to the final round interviews, how quickly they're making the decision. And so it could be that they're actually, they're interviewing people, um, you're the last candidate, and then the next day that they'll be meeting, uh, meeting to make that final decision. Someone asked about salary expectations. So I did suggest that it's okay to mention a range that you found on Glassdoor for a position, or should you be more specific? So I actually wouldn't necessarily say that I found um, a salary range on Glassdoor. I would just say based off of my research, I think an appropriate range for someone with my level, like for this particular role, my level of experience is this to this. And I would keep my salary range between five to $10,000. Um, I think anything beyond that, it's just too vague. Uh, I think most employers actually prefer a range between five, but sometimes if you're just, if you're finding a ton of information online and it's hard to pinpoint on what you think a fair range would be, um, I think 10,000 as a range is okay. And again, the goal is to not discuss salary until you have the offer um, because you really don't have much power to negotiate. And so, uh, and if you could get the person to say, uh, what they think would be a fair range um, first, it kind of puts the ball in your court. So if they say something that they think is much lower than you expect, then you can negotiate from there. But you definitely don't want to say, well, I think a fair salary for that would be $50,000. And they're actually thinking $80,000. So um, it's good to see if they have any ideas and then using that um, for negotiation purposes. 
uh, there's really there's a big art to to this aspect. Um, so, uh, if you ever have an opportunity to to learn more about the art of negotiating, I would definitely encourage you to do that. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, I know we went through a lot today. Uh, so if you, if you do wanna follow up with um, something very specific, feel free to reach out. Um, again, connecting on LinkedIn is a, is a good way. So if someone asked if salary expectations are asked, what to do if salary expectations are a question asked by HR right up front. And so I actually, this does happen in certain industries and I will say I find it to be pretty common if you're working with a recruiter. Um, and really the goal at this point when it's asked up front, is to they already have a range on what the company can do or what they can offer for this position. And they want to know if there is overlap between what you're suggesting and are looking for and what they're willing to do. Um, and so oftentimes they really want you to give an answer and it's hard to postpone. Um, I usually try to use a tactic where, you know, it's difficult for me to say what I, th what I, I think a, appropriate compensa compensation would be for the role without knowing more. But if I had to guess based off the information that I've found on the job description, um, again, as well as, you know, my experience and level of education, I think a fair range would be this to this. So you're giving yourself the wiggle room that you don't know enough about the role to confidently say that this is what your range are. So if as you move forward in the process, you find out the job is a lot more complex or there's additional responsibilities that you didn't appreciate, this does give you the wiggle room to say, you know, although like, if you're like, well, I actually think a fair range is this, and they said, well, initially you said this to this, you can, you said, well, now I have more insight about the role. Someone asked, uh, how do you feel about approaching topics related to the interviews, company-wide diversity, inclusion practices during the interview? I think it's perfectly fine to bring that up. Um, I actually encourage you to bring that up, um, especially as you're getting further along in the interview. If you're now one of the final candidates and this is something that you value, I think it's important to ask about. I would also do your due diligence to look at information online. Um, and it may be appropriate for you to also do some informational interviews with other ind individuals at the company. So if it's a bigger company, you know, you know, and you're interviewing one division, there's nothing to prevent you from connect, connect, uh, connecting on LinkedIn with someone else in a different division to try to get more insight about the organization. I think especially now that we're in the virtual space, it is really hard to envision what your work situation will be once um, this is over and you're returning into a more more normal work situation. And so again, trying to get as much insight as possible, I think is, is really helpful. Again, I think especially as trainees, when we're making the transition from grad school or postdoc into that work environment, whether it's for a faculty position in industry or whatever sector it is that you're interested in joining, it, it, I think you're in such a training mindset, you're not thinking about the fact that you have value um, and that you have a lot to contribute. And so, part of this interview process is not only selling yourself as the best candidate for the role, but you really want to make sure it's a good fit for you. And that, you know, ideally a, a company is going to want to invest in someone being there for multiple years, maybe not necessarily in the same role, but I know for large biotech companies, oftentimes they want to see a candidate that can come in in a specific position, but that really could be a vital member of the team for long term, that they could potentially promote to other roles down in the future. And so really that good fit is, is essential both from the company's perspective, but also for you. <laughs> 